Okay, Ellen, we're going to have that quick delay that I warn you about as Facebook streams us over to chat with our mighty mystery fans. And it looks like we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am thrilled, pun intended, to be hosting the incredible and real-life P.I. Ellen McGarrahan, author of Two Truths and a lie out in the U.S. now. Ellen, joining us from London, welcome to Mighty Mysteries. Tell us about your book. Thank you so much. It's so amazing to be here. Just yeah. incredible work that you're doing, and I'm just thrilled. Um, so as you mentioned, I am a private investigator. I've been a private investigator for 25 years, wow. and um, um, what my book is doing, what what I the story that I'm telling in my book is the story of my own investigation into the mystery that was in the center of my own life. Mm. And it's a um it's an investigation into whether the man that I saw executed in Florida in the electric chair was innocent. Um, in 1990, I was a newspaper reporter and I was assigned to go and witness the execution of a man in Florida State Prison in the electric chair. And um, the electric chair actually malfunctioned during the execution and he, uh, he caught on fire, his head caught on fire. And um, after that happened, that, that caused me to, to really um, have a lot of questions and reevaluate um, my life. And I ended up leaving journalism and I became a private investigator. Um, I moved out to San Francisco and started working out there. And for the next 25 years, I worked um, on being uh, learning to be an investigator. I formed my own business, I'm licensed. Um, I, got, I trained doing that. And during that period of time, new evidence and news reports really began to gather that the man that I had seen executed was innocent. And um, that really haunted me. That was something that I found very, very difficult to, yeah. to, to even contemplate. And so I put it aside for a really long time. And then um, I finally decided that it was going to be something that I wasn't going to be able to run away from. I was actually going to have to figure that out. And so mm. in 2015, I kind of put my, my wife and my work and my job on hold. And I went and decided that I really needed to use my investigation skills to, to investigate this mystery that had really taken over my own life. Um, yeah. And so I went back to Florida and then... In investigating, I ended up going literally around the world. I went to Ireland. I went to Australia. Um, it, I had thought it was going to be kind of a dusty court case, kind of a couple of interviews kind of investigation. But I ended up very quickly in the Florida of the 1970s, which is when the, the crime that was uh, at the basis of this happened. And um, it was kind of a, it was just a crazy world. I found, you know, cocaine and, and religious cults and, um, ended up with jewel thieves and movie stars and the Irish Republican army. It got really, very, very, very chaotic. And it also led me to a really dark place inside my own life, which is something that I really hadn't expected starting out. Um, and so ultimately the book is about finding resolution. It's about confronting your own past. It's about mm. looking at your own mistakes. It's very much about trauma, but it's also very much about healing. Wow. Wow. Oh my gosh. Well, Ellen, I have to tell you, I am reading it now and I am floored because as you just talked about, this is an intense book. This is a crazy story. And what I love about nonfiction as a nonfiction writer myself is that as Mark Twain said, truth is stranger than fiction. So whereas novelists, fiction writers, those poor jerks have to make their books believable but nonfiction writers can lean into the truth being stranger than fiction, embrace it and go where the story leads. You don't have the burden of trying to make it feel believable. You can say, when someone says, oh, that would never happen, you can say, oh, but it did. Mm -hmm. um, and you can lean into that and you do. And it is also so incredibly beautifully written. I mean, this book, is every, sometimes I just pause and reread sentences because it's so beautifully crafted. 
Um, so I, I'm so excited to have you here and I'm so excited to talk about all of that. I just want to pause and welcome everyone on Facebook. So my partner in crime, pun intended, Ms. Margaret Pinard is handling things over there. Margaret's also an author um, and, and we partner on these every week. So Margaret, we're in good hands with her. Um, and all of our mystery and thriller fans, welcome. If you've been here before, you know how this works. And if you're new, here's how it works. This is your chance to talk to our featured author today, Ellen McGarrahan. And the coolest part is this woman is also a private investigator in real life. So, wow, we've never had a private investigator on before. So you can ask her anything about this gorgeous and powerful and moving new book that she has written. You can ask her about her writing process. You can ask her anything you want. This is your chance to talk to her. So um, I'm, I just want to, I'll be monitoring things over here on my second screen. Um, Gail is saying she loves these snowy day tea time chats. And this is giving us tons of hearts up. People are saying, wow, what a powerful story. What an incredible story. Um, Gail saying she loves <laughs> these tea time events. Patricia saying, whoa, what a crazy story. Absolutely. You're all reading my mind. Um, Wow, wow, wow. Mr. Patricia says, mystery nightmare. Ellen, how did you cope? Were you able to talk through what you witnessed to finding your own peace? Patricia, getting right to the heart of the issue. Ellen, tell us. That is a beautiful question. And it's actually a question that I didn't know to ask myself for a really long time because when I was a newspaper reporter, I thought that the the reaction that I was having, the, the, the kind of um, the emotions that I was feeling about it were just not you know, I was supposed to be like a really tough reporter and just, you know, handle it and move on. Um, and I did mm. really try to do that for a really long period of time. Um, and it wasn't until I just kept reading the reports of that, um, the man that I, whose wet execution I witnessed was innocent. That's when it, it just really began to be something that I felt haunted by. Um, mm. Ultimately, I think investigating the case was very helpful because um, finding, you know, really digging down into the, the facts of the case and being able to um, really explore those and, and kind of come up with um, conclusions and, and resolutions in that way was really helpful. It was a murder that happened in 1976 on the side of a highway in Florida, in a rest area that had long since been torn down. So I started with almost no information. I had some, some news clippings and an interview, and that's where I started. And I built on that and ended up, you know, um, spending months in Florida and then going around the world to talk to people. So that mm. was all very helpful. But the other thing that really surfaced during this was, was the trauma of it, which I hadn't, I had not understood that I had, was carrying any kind of sense of trauma about it, which sounds a little bit like I should have known that, but I just didn't, you know, I had put it away like so hard that I just couldn't find it. But working on really understanding the case brought me into sort of daily contact with just not just the execution, but but the murders themselves. And um, mm. that was just very hard to deal with. And ultimately it did force me to, um, to address it. And so mm. I ended up um, doing a, a round of EMDR therapy, which I think is just incredibly under, under well-known. It should be more known than it is. And it's incredibly effective. And that with combined with the writing of the book, I think was what really enabled me ultimately to put it behind me and, and come to peace about it. Yes, thank you for that um, incredibly thoughtful answer, Patricia, a top community member here. Thank you for your incredibly thoughtful question. And I just wanna pause and, and say, Ellen, I think you need to give yourself grace. Of course you couldn't find that trauma um, at first, and I think that as I'm reading this book, I understand that for several reasons. Number one, you were a kid. You were just fresh out of school. You were, and, I, and there's a scene in the book where you're talking about how five years earlier you were sitting in the classroom analyzing the executioner's song. Right. Uh, and then to go from that classroom experience to being this young, you know, this young, eager, um, eager to work hard, eager to establish herself reporter. And to have the bureau say, yes, we should send Ellen. <laughs> Ellen volunteered, but Ellen didn't know what she was volunteering for. And for the bureau chief to say, yeah, we should send her, the new person, um, to go and witness someone's death. Now, they, I think, you know, you make it clear in the book, nobody actually thought this was going to happen. Usually there's a stay of execution. Um, mm -hmm. But your friend Tex was saying, it's really no big deal. He had witnessed two. Usually they don't happen. But if they do, it's, it's, it's over quickly and you're not going to be affected. 
nobody was really dealing with it. Also, it was 1990. No one was, we weren't having the conversations 30 years ago that we're having now, um, honoring mm -hmm. the people's trauma. And so a lot has changed, but I think those three factors, you know, and then also there's all this pressure to be, you know, a woman and to be able to handle things, to be able to move on, to take it and, and to process it and, you know, not really deal with it, just be okay. Um, and I think now only in the, you know, in the past year we're or years, we're really starting to say, actually, this is, you know, this is intense. This is a lot. And let's pause here and deal with it. So, um, and I think your book is bringing up and, and honoring that and dealing with that in a really powerful and meaningful way. Um, and, and thank you, Patricia, for honing in on that so quickly and, and Ellen for that, that thoughtful answer. Um, Margaret saying Florida of the 1970s, cocaine, drug cartels, IRA activity, jewel thieves. Wow, are we missing anything? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's pretty crazy. Did you have any idea that was where the story was going to go when you started to investigate it? I had no idea. Um, it, I just want to thank you for your really perceptive comments earlier about that. It really is. And especially I was a I was a young reporter and I was the only woman there and I did feel pressure. Um, and I, I like the way the world has changed, though, of course, I think we need to con continue going in that direction. Um, in terms of Florida, you know, I didn't I don't think I would have imagine that I would get in, into this particular story because I did think I've done a lot of investigations where I go back in time. It's one of the things I think that um, I have a lot of experience with in as a private investigator. And I like to think of private investigation in any case as time travel. You know, you're sort of, you're sitting here in the present, but you have to go back and understand something that happened in the past. And to do that, you know, you can do that through public records and you can do it through interviews kind of just the basic gumshoe stuff. And so I have a lot of experience in doing that, but in my two decades of investigation, I've never stumbled into a world that is like 1970s Florida. Um, it was on the, the, just the cusp of when, um, as far as I understand it, the cocaine trade there was, what hadn't become sort of highly professional. It wasn't my own advice yet. It was just <laughs> kind of a bunch of, of high school friends who had stumbled into a very, very high stakes, very dangerous gig. And uh, things kind of got out of control and they spiraled out from there. And so it was a surprise to find myself in that world. And it was also something that was um, really, really interesting to talk to people about. And I was well, really amazed actually at the, the, the people that I was talking to were casting back 40 years in their memories. And they were probably able to talk about things now that they wouldn't have then just because you know, the way that, that memory and time can work, it can make it easier actually to talk about stuff like that now than it would have been at the time. Absolutely, absolutely. Trisha says, this sounds fascinating. Trisha, you're reading my mind, you're speaking for all of us. Absolutely, I am completely fascinated. Um, I wanna make sure I don't miss a single question or comment. Um, Anissa, a top community member, Anissa Joy saying, how long did you spend investigating these events? Yeah. Walk us through this. So you, you're, you're a young, eager beaver reporter. You uh, are the only woman in your bureau. You're eager to prove yourself. You want to be tough. You want to do this. You go to this execution. Um, then you end up in San Francisco. And there is a really powerful moment where you're watching 2020 one night. Walk us through the start of this, where it all started. Uh, yeah. Um, about two years after the execution, I was in, I had moved to California and I was working as a construction worker. I kind of threw my life out the window and I, I set tile for a number of years out there, which was a very, very heavy, difficult job. And mm. um, it also wasn't something that my life to the date had prepared me for. And so it was an interesting way to be in the world. And I came home one night and I watched 2020 because I was still, of course, an, a news person. And um, they had a show on that, um, that essentially again said that the it was a, uh, a news report that that said that the person that i had witnessed his, his execution basically said that he was an innocent person i realize i'm stumbling here but when i get when i get into this it, it just tends to trigger the trauma i apologize i'm not particularly articulate when i start talking either about the execution or this particular thing so in any case i saw it on tv and i just i literally froze and i just um, I, it's like my, just 
couldn't believe it. And that's, um, that's really, I think, when my thinking about it started, but my first reaction was to put it away. And I really put it away for another almost 10 years. And then I mm. realized that I had to confront it. And so for my investigation, what I did is I just do what I always do, which is for my, um, in my professional life, I just try to talk to everyone and look at everything. So I figured out where the court records were. Court records are public records. You can go look at them. So I looked at, my, at the public records and I found the old case reports and I looked through them. And then I looked through um, those public records for the names of the people who had been witnesses at the time you know, like not now, but back then in the 1970s. And I went and I, I found those people and I talked to them. And that's just a, like a very basic kind of gumshoe investigation that, mm. um, you know, that, that is something that I do sort of all the time professionally. And it was just interesting to do it for my own life, actually. Mm. It's fascinating to do it for your own life. And so, so Anissa, uh, a top few new member asking the good questions as always. So Anissa, the, I, I, the, the timeline is in 1990, Ellen, eager beaver reporter, witnesses this execution. She, it's too painful and traumatic. She leaves that for a couple of years. She's sitting in San Francisco trying to move on. She turns on the TV one night and 2020 has her article with her byline up on the TV. I mean, can you imagine you're just trying to relax, have a nice tea, have a snack before dinner, and there is your article. And Barbara Walters wearing a yellow suit is saying, was this man innocent? Right. Brain blown, like, oh my God, what a crazy moment. Um, too much puts it away. Then in 2011, Ellen realizes she's not going to get peace until she investigates this. She has to do what she does so well, which is to be a private investigator in her real life. And she has to go back and investigate this case. She has to understand, was this man innocent? Now, 10 years later, 2021, the book right. just came out February 2nd. You guys have got to read it. It is so powerful and it is so incredibly beautifully written. And just as Ellen is being so present and so open-hearted and so authentic in this moment, all of that energy comes out on the page. I am, you guys, I'm riveted. Like, no, all, I, I can't, this, I'm devouring this book, but I'm devouring it slowly because I'm enjoying every beautifully crafted phrase. So grab it today through our partnership with bookshop.org, support independent bookstores, because we want independent bookstores to be, a, to be in the world when we come out of this mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, uh, Patricia says, I'm so glad you were able to heal, not forget, but to live without fear or guilt. I ache for you. Oh, and anyone that has been violated by trauma on a different note, did you have a chance to speak to the innocent man's family? If so, how did you approach them? I'm sure their hearts are shattered. And you did, you did talk to Jesse Tafaro's mom, um, and also his oh, no. partners. I, I, I didn't, she's, she's actually deceived. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. She does appear in the book, though, with comments um, in articles she, where right. she's yeah. she's protesting her son's uh, she's advocating her son's innocence. Right, and she had um, she had uh, she she sadly died uh, ten years before um, I believe it was ten years. I'm sorry. Um, she was commenting when Sunny, who was his girlfriend at the time, when she was released from prison. Right. Exactly. It, that Jesse's mom was commenting and saying she she's glad Sonny's uh, Sonny, who has been released, Sonia has been released from prison, but she is sad that her son was not. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I just wanted to correct a, a, a statement earlier, which is that my investigation concerned whether or not the, um, the Jesse Tafaro, who was the person I saw executed, was innocent. So the book is about that search. Yes, thank you. That it is the search for that truth that leads you back to the 1970s Florida, the cocaine, the cartels, and your own something from your own history as well. Right. So, a very powerful and far reaching book. Um, uh, Margaret saying that she loved that you said, I like the way the world has changed on how we process trauma. I loved that line as well. Thank you, Margaret. Um, Margaret saying uh, also, I like to think of any investigation as time travel. Ellen, I love this. Can you talk a little more about the time travel? I, that also caught my interest. Thanks, Margaret. That's, that's a great that's question. A great, another great, really great question. Um, well, if you, I think investigators are, we're here in the present and then we're also 
we occupy the space where what we're investigating happened. And we do that by talking to people mainly, um, and also mm. by seeing records that are created contemporaneously. So not now, but, but then. Mm. And, um, you know, I think that there's a there's an idea that I have formed through all these years of investigation, which is that we do live on in the in the lives and memories of the people who know us. And mm. I think that's one of the privileges of being an investigator is being able to talk to people about um, the lives that that we share with each other, which is really, mm. um, you know, we, we're connected in ways that I think possibly we don't always recognize or don't always honor. And it's always amazing to me to be able to talk to people. Um, so that's the part of the work that I feel is is brings a lot to my life. And it's also a very, very uh, big part of the time travel because, you know, we remember, we hold on to things, we we speak mm. from our memories. And, you know, the, the job of the investigator is to take all those pieces of the puzzle and put them down and sort of see how they fit and then see where the truth is. Um, <sighs> but that's, that is the, um, you know, as we go through time, we kind of, we, we take, we, we take our experiences with us. And so that's the time travel aspect of it. Ah, my heart feels so full. I mean, this heartfelt, open-hearted approach that you bring to your work of honoring and remembering and searching for truth. My heart feels so full. What about you guys? Isn't this such an incredible heart-filling interview? Wow, Ellen, thank you so thank much. You. Um, Patricia saying, please don't apologize. Triggers are powerful. You are safe here. You are appreciated. We value all your thoughts and this journey. Patricia, mm -hmm. another yogi, or I mean, I don't know if you're a yogi or not, Patricia, but that sounds very yogic. And I could not have said it more beautifully or more lovingly. Thank you for that. I love my community here because of people like Patricia. Thank you for that. That's beautiful. Um, uh, question, do you talk about being a construction worker in San Francisco in the 90s and that, quote, throwing out of your life plan in the memoir? Great question. I, I do. I tried to be really honest in the in the memoir. Um, you know, it's a book that's a kind of a combination of a true crime and memoir, which I realize is something that's it's kind of a new, it's a new aspect of it. Um, and I initially tried to write it just straight true crime, just the facts, um, mm. because that's my training as an investigator and also as a reporter. Um, but I found that um, in order to really tell the story that I needed, the story needed a narrator and I realized it was it was actually gonna have to be me. Yeah. And that's when I, that's essentially when I, I realized that I was going to have to do the thing that I never do as an investigator. I don't open up, you know, and the, mm. the word private is literally built into my job description. I'm a private <laughs> investigator. And so trying to actually get myself on the page felt really, 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 really difficult. But I think ultimately it was the thing that was very healing. And so I do, I do write about, um, I write about essentially a lot more than I plan to. And it's, it's, um, it, it all has to do with the case. And it also has to do with like the experience, the real life experience of actually being a private detective, you know, mm. the kind of risks and the perils and the, um, the cost of it in addition to the adventure um, of it. And that was something mm. that was really interesting to explore in the book. Oh, I love that. Anissa saying, I can't wait to read this. Thank you. Um, oh, Patricia saying, Ellen, do you realize how brave you are? I am blown away. Patricia, once again, could not have said it by my, better Thank myself. You. I am also just sort of sitting here in awe of this woman's courage and incredible open-hearted bravery to put yourself on the page like that and to be so open and so vulnerable this is so really much. special thank you thank you patricia um um ground <laughs> groundbreaking new genre true crime and memoir bam um patricia would like to know who did you lean on when you were writing Ooh, another good question yeah how did you what was that like who did you lean on who do i lean on when you were writing this, did you have someone, did you have a team or someone who was supporting you, your wife or? Amazing, amazing editors, I have to say. Um, mm. I have a, an absolutely steadfast and wonderful agent. And I have, um, my husband is my partner and he's an amazing editor himself and a writer. And so it was, 
really great, although very difficult to get the feedback. You know, Mike wrote probably 12 drafts and it started, you know, it started as a really a mammoth, massive thing. And I slowly began to find the story. Um, but I had a ton of help from some amazingly talented people, all of whom for some reason were able to kind of ride out all of the, the difficulties of me trying to figure out a way to tell the story. And I just mm. I absolutely couldn't possibly be more grateful because there's no way I could have just sat down and, and kind of done what I used to do as a journalist, which is to just write it on deadline and start at the beginning and up at the end and I'm done. It was a surprise to realize that it actually was much, 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 much more difficult than that. It took me a really long time to figure it out. Yes. And there's a tightness to your writing that I think I see in, in authors who, who are former journalists, there's a tightness and, and, and there's a, there's a beautiful, um, you know, precision to your writing. Um, but also we're talking about a book that is this wide instead of an article <laughs> that's yeah. a couple hundred words. Right. So that's, that's a big shift. Um, Patricia's saying, I am shameless. I want to go for a walk with Ellen and take Sarah's dog for a walk. Patricia, <laughs> good. it's it's a date. Let's do it. I'll bring Pelu the Wonder Pup. We'll we'll walk and we'll talk with Ellen because we should we'll just go on a big on a walk because this that sounds fantastic. <laughs> um Margaret saying 12 drafts, good gravy, lady. Well done. Tell us about the 12 drafts. Did this book change drastically from, from draft one? If so, how? It changed a lot. It changed um in terms of um not so much the case aspect of it, but the, the, the trying to figure out how to write about being a private investigator changed a lot. And it got mm. a lot closer to, um, it, it, it just kind of focused in a lot more. And um, I've learned that, I've heard, I've read that writing is actually rewriting. And I think I really lived that truth for sure. Mm. It was a great experience. It was really interesting. I was really interested as a writer to realize that, you know, the whole idea of, of doing a terrible first draft is actually for me, it turned out to be true and also very productive. It's a great mm. way to just get the thoughts out and then just keep working at it. Oh, I love that. Margaret would like to know, has the PI business brought Ellen to London or was it your author career? Yeah, what are you doing in London? Um, just enjoying the city. I'm a city person. <laughs> <laughs> I really like it here. It's been interesting. Um, no, it was, just a, it was just a decision to come over here. Fantastic. Um, Margaret's books actually center on England and Scotland. So I know that she is a fan. Oh, wow. um, and I have lived in London as well. And uh, I think London is a great city. So that yeah. it definitely makes sense that you would want to, to spend some time to spend some time over there. Mm -hmm. Um, oh my God, I just realized we only have two minutes left with Ellen. So we're going to enter a lightning round. If anyone has any last questions for Ellen about the book, about her writing, about her PI business, go ahead and get them in, in, the, in, the, in the comments and Margaret and I will get them right over to her. Um, and meanwhile, I, something I want to know, Ellen, what uh, <laughs> Margaret's saying, I'm just being crazy jealous over here. I know Margaret needs to get back to London <laughs> uh, when this pandemic to end. Ellen, what is, you know, there's so much to discuss about this book. Um, and I think your search for truth and your search for justice and your search for peace and for resolution are certainly at the forefront. Is there anything else that, you know, what do you want people to feel or learn having, having spent these, this time in your pages with you? Um, that's a really lovely question. Um, I think I think I think one of the things that's really important to me, um, and of course it's in the title of the book, is is that we learn to sort of sort through truth and lies because I feel like it's something that we're really wrestling with now as a, mm. in our new um, information environment, and that really learning to um, to understand and analyze information I think would be a really really key thing, and just mm. the you know the the ways that that's possible to do and the necessity of it. Mm. Oh, that's so interesting. One thing that I thought was, was really interesting, uh, one of the many, many, um, is when you interview for your first PI job in San Francisco, 
um, you're you're in the job interview. You're chatting with the guy who in in, in who's you know potentially going to hire you, and you're talking about you know what why you want to do this work, and you tell him the story from your grade school days with I believe a nun. A, a sister and you and 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 somehow from this story he says to you i'm gonna hire you because you're motivated by guilt which was really interesting because i that's not what i took from that story <laughs> um uh, so what i took from this story is that whether it's it's in your career as a journalist or your career as a pi or your career as an author what motivates you is the search for truth the search the search for justice and getting to that kernel of that truth that kernel of that of that justice what did you think of that moment do you think you're motivated by guilt what, what was that about um i think at the time i probably was although i didn't realize it it was one of those very perceptive comments that people make where you think do I, am I, do I have a name tag? You know, am I wearing that? Um, I know that was weird yeah, <laughs> and crazy. Well, you know, I think it is a, it's a question like a, just as being a student of people that, mm. that that was possible to make that comment. Um, I don't think I am now. I think uh, it's justice and it's uh, truth that motivate me. And I don't necessarily think those come from guilt, but I do feel like um, having experienced the world through that lens, it, it, you know, gave me the ability to really try to push through it and, and understand it better. Oh, I love that. Gail, a top community member here, writing mystery member saying, thank you, Ellen, such a difficult real life story to process for you and your readers. Thank you for bringing it to us. The Beth, the, excuse me, the death penalty is a polarizing issue in the world. Um, Gail, I could not have said that more eloquently. Thank you for that. Um, and, and I think why, it, you know, it's a, it's a polarizing issue for many reasons, but especially because when this happens uh, and then later you think, oh God, <laughs> was this guy innocent um, and it's irrevocable. It's, it's that finality that's, you know, so terror, terrifying. Um, one of the many terrifying aspects of this, of this issue. Um, Patricia, Patricia is saying as a journalist, I'm sure as, oops, sorry, so many comments are coming in. Um, I, um, they're pushing up the thrust. Patricia saying, as a journalist, I'm sure as soon as you put pen to page, the words just flew, or did they? This is such a uniquely difficult story. Did you have to force the words or was there so much welled up inside? It was a release to finally put it on paper. Um, do you have, okay, there's a couple, there's a, this is actually a five part question. So let's hear that part first. And then I'm gonna give you the other parts. Uh, no, they definitely, they were, there was, it's the situation where the words are welling, but they're caught behind a dam. It was very difficult. Uh, it was a very difficult process. Um, and I, I did find that um, it took a lot of just trial and error, you know, painstaking drafts and, and just really trying to figure out what it was that I wanted to say. And um, I wish they had just come out, but they did not. Mm, which you would never know reading it because it flows so effortlessly on the page. It feels as though, as, I, as I'm reading it, it feels like this was a story that needed to, to be told and it poured effortlessly and, and in fully formed, beautifically, beautifully <laughs> honed sentences, which of course I know is not the case, but that's what it feels like. Right. Patricia would like to know, uh, so this is the other, two, the other few parts of her question. Do you have any regrets about this, the writing of it? I do not, no. Good. Would you change anything about your process or what you wish you would have known before you took this on? Ooh, good question. I, I don't think so. Again, it was just, it was the, it was, and I appreciate the questions. I think they're wonderful, wonderful questions. And it's not stuff that I've thought about before. So that's mm. really interesting. But my instant reaction clearly is no. I think that the process as difficult it was ended up being a healing process. And I'm glad um, to have, even though it was very difficult to uh, encounter the, um, the difficulties of both of the investigation and of my own journey with it. Um, mm, I think- I love that. I think ultimately, I think EMDR was, I uh, have tried to understand it and I might be just speaking completely off the cuff here, but I think it was um, a therapy that was discovered right around 1990. So I do have a regret that that was something that I only availed myself of three decades later. Because I do mm. feel like uh, living with trauma is a very difficult thing and that the treatments are out there and that they work. And so um, being able to um, have the benefit of it now, if I had discovered that 
30 years ago, I definitely think that that would have been a good thing. And I would urge really, you know, I read newspaper stories now about people who have witnessed a violent event as I did. And I just think, wow, you know, it, there's a therapy out there that works. And so that is probably the one thing that I wish um, I had had a different journey with. And I would urge people to really avail themselves of it if it's something that they think would help. Mm, I love that. I love that. And I have so many friends who have benefited from EMDR. It's really a powerful, incredible tool. Yeah, um, yeah. Well said. Margaret suggesting that motivated by guilt sounds like a good title for your next mystery. <laughs> <laughs> I think Margaret, we're going to have to have that walk, frankly. Yeah, Margaret, you're coming on the walk with, with, exactly. with Patricia and Paley, right. the wonder pup and me and Ellen. That's right. fantastic. Um, absolutely. Yes. It, so, okay. If Ellen writes a book, her next book, Motivated by Guilt. We remember you saw it. You all saw it here first. This was the moment of genius, the moment of conception. Uh, this it was a group effort. Right. <laughs> That's your next title of, yeah. of, of your of your book. I <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, oh my gosh. Well, Ellen. Thank you so much for coming on here and for your open heartedness, for your authenticity, for your transparency, for sharing with us. This has been a heart filling, soul enriching conversation. Um, and Margaret just posted the, um, the link to the book um, in uh, bookshop.org, uh, getting hearts up from Facebook. Guys, you have to read this book. It's, it's so great. And come back and tell us what you think about it because it is um, it's been absolutely, this book is just so beautifully written. I'm completely enraptured. Um, people are saying, thank you so much for our Mighty Mystery guest, Ellen McGarrihan. Absolutely. Patricia saying, thank you all so much. Ellen, I wish you nothing but happiness and calm joy. Margaret, you're a rock star. <laughs> Sarah, I adore you muchly. Your yoga mat or mine, wink, wink. <laughs> oh my gosh, it just keeps getting better here. Um, uh, I need to go outside and build a cairn for Ellen as soon as the snow melts and I can find the backyard. <laughs> Yes, we're having a blizzard here. Right. Um, absolutely. Thank, thank you, you for thank spending you so your snowy afternoon with us, everybody. Um, and thank you for all of your wonderful comments and questions for Ellen. This has been such a fascinating, fabulous conversation. I will see you all next week right here on A Mighty Mystery. And Ellen, I'm going to see you next time when you come back Very and, cool. and uh, with, with, your, with your next title of your book, which was designed right here. <laughs> Exactly. Thank you so much. It's been an amazing conversation and I really feel like I've just, uh, I've learned a lot and it's been really great. Thank you. Oh my, you're getting so many hearts up from Facebook. I feel like I've learned a lot and I know you all have too. This has been again, such a wonderfully enriching conversation. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you soon.